I call upon Dr. Sachin Gupta on the stage. He is head of uh, critical care, Narayana Super Speciality Hospital. He's been international faculty of Win Focus, editor of critical care communications. He's been examiner for IDCCM, ISCCM national executive member and a member of examination committee of ISCCM. He will be telling us about a very important topic of ultrasound and echo in ER. Dr. Sachin. Good afternoon, everybody. I have jumped the line, so my lecture was after this, and I would first like to thank the organizers for having me here. The talk was given to me, use of ultrasound in ER and ICU, and actually, I do a two-day workshop which was asked to compile in half an hour, so please pardon me for my speed, right, for this stuff. Now, uh, for last around 12 years or so, Ultrasound is a part of my life, I would say this way. My all rounds are with the ultrasound. So I have a cow that is uh, a computer on wheels, so that takes care of my investigations and orders. And I have an ultrasound machine that goes with me on. So this is what we do and what we preach. And there are certain guidelines for the use of ultrasound in critical care, and I'll just uh, go with them. So what happened was traditionally ultrasound was done by the radiologist or I would say rather by the technicians. The, the films used to go to the uh, radiology room. They used to interpret the films and they used to give the report, but there was no correlation with the patient. What was the patient at the bedside, which was traditionally nowadays, yes, the radiologists do try to ask the history and try to correlate it with the findings. But what critical care and ER is doing is point of care. That is, you get the machine at the bedside, which is portable, which is lightweight, which is easy to manufacture, which is easy to carry around. And it is more of diagnosis related rather than just an interpretation of the findings. Gallbladder has gallstones. That makes no sense to me. Is it cholecystitis which is causing my patient to go in shock? That makes more sense. What are the other organs which are involved along with it? That makes more sense to me. So the concept was published in NEGM, and this was point of care ultrasound, and this was in 2011. The first concept that was said, and the same definition was used that get the machine at the bedside, right? And this was, they called it as a stethoscope, an ultrasound stethoscope. As you have your stethoscope around the neck, have the transducer with you always with all the patients. So it is being increasingly used by intensivists. It influences the diagnosis. The best part is the modern machines are compact, cheap. They have excellent resolution. It is reproducible. So if you are doing it, n number of people will look at it. Radiation hazards are not there. This study was an important study. Now, they, they kept it as an ICU sound protocol. And what they did was every patient who was admitted in emergency underwent two things. One, a probable diagnosis by the clinician. Two, an ultrasound-based diagnosis. 26% of patients had their diagnosis changed. Around 18% of patients underwent certain amount of procedures just on the ultrasound findings rather than on the clinical findings. Almost one-fourth of the patients, our clinical judgment can go a little wrong there. What are the applications? Anything that you can think of, right? Right from diagnostic to therapeutic, even to monitoring. So if I call about diagnostic, we'll start with airway. So it is airway patency, deviation, pleural effusion, pneumothorax, consolidation, pulmonary embolism, Cardiac issues, so left ventricular failure, pulmonary edema, fluid responsiveness, DVT, even intraperitoneal bleed. Therapeutic central venous access, the most studied, the most accessed modality when it comes to ultrasound. Intercostal drainage, thoracosentences, abdominal parasentesis, even positioning of IABP if it is not done in cath lab, if it is done at the bedside, you can position your IABP, your PA catheters, pacing wires, certain procedures like CRICO and PCT, and assessment. So fluid status, recruitment, lung recruitment is a very important modality which we can do with the help of an ultrasound and even when we are looking at resolution of pneumothorax. When such a kind of patient lands to an emergency and when you are not able to ventilate this patient, you are not even able to intubate this patient, so you, you would like to do a cricothyroidotomy as was told earlier, right? Uh, an emergency cricothyroidotomy. But just by palpation, is it possible to understand where is cricothyroid, where is trachea? It's, it's a by chance maneuver. But what ultrasound will do it, 
just with the help of a probe you keep it on the neck and try to find this kind of pattern and this is what the ultrasound image would tell us so this first part is the thyroid cartilage this oval part is the cricoid cartilage these are the tracheal rings and if you look at this image the cricothyroidotomy followed by a tracheostomy was done and look at the position so just blindly puncturing the neck probably you will cause more harm you don't know what are you puncturing are you in the right track and that is a panic situation i tell you when you are doing a cricothyroidotomy in an emergency scenario it's an absolute panic scenario there even the best of the people would panic at that moment so that is where the utility of ultrasound would come in second is intubation as was told is ICU intubation the same as as OT intubation no not at all right so capnography yes is the gold standard but when we are intubating any patient there are two concerns that is the tube in the right track that is one so is it in the esophagus or in the trachea and if you say it is in the trachea then second question is is it endobronchial or is it bilateral so even with the help of ultrasound we can do that very easily now this is when the probe is placed in a transverse manner over the thyroid cartilage just below it this part is the thyroid gland this is the isthmus again the thyroid gland this is the trachea that you are seeing and once somebody is intubating just the other person should keep the probe at that point if you see movement in the trachea just the movement in the trachea the disturbance in the trachea you are very sure that the first question has been answered that is the tube is in the right tube that is the tube is in the trachea what happens if you have done an esophageal intubation now the and the ultrasound doesn't understand trachea and esophagus it understands a tube which is filled with air so if i'm putting an endotracheal tube in my esophagus ultrasound will say okay this patient has two tracheas right one the god has made a trachea the second you made a trachea right so it with this we call as a double trachea sign or a pseudo trachea sign so if you look at this now this patient was intubated esophageally so it looked similar to the trachea second no movement in the trachea if you withdraw the trachea esophagus is a self collapsible structure it would immediately collapse so this double trachea would go away now look at this the the endotracheal tube would be withdrawn and the esophagus would eventually collapse now there is no double trachea sign so again just keep the probe here let the other person do his job you would one come to know is he doing the right job or not this so this is what we showed in the first slide the thyroid cartilage the cricoid cartilage so we know the distance between them is the cricothyroid membrane and this is what it helps when you are doing an emergency cricothyroidotomy the another important point is subcutaneous emphysema now air is an enemy of ultrasound we should understand so where there is air ultrasound will not be beneficial then the question is how come lung ultrasound right lung is full of air lung ultrasound is based on artifacts so what artifacts these this air would produce is what we are interpreting here the air is just under the skin so as soon as the the transmission of the radiation from the ultrasound transducer goes it is under the skin the air is there and starts getting reflected back so subcutaneous emphysema is the only contraindication or i would say only hindrance in doing ultrasound but remember only in the area where there is subcutaneous emphysema if i have a subcutaneous emphysema in the right upper area that should not stop me from doing an ultrasound of the other areas that part was called as e lines what we call that as e lines so my first question although the answer has already been which is the best probe to scan the airway now airway is a superficial structure remember so linear or the vascular probe is the best probe when we are scanning this area one the footprint is very small the airway is a smaller structure right so that is the uh, best probe to scan the airway so when it comes to breathing in 1992 harrison published that lung ultrasound 
is not possible. The ultrasound of the thorax is not possible, right? In 1993, there was a chapter in Harrison itself on lung ultrasound. So within a year, he got an insight that probably he was wrong. So within a year, there was a 15-page chapter on lung ultrasound in Harrison itself. And again, as I said, anything that you can think of. So if you talk about lung ultrasound, whether it starts from intubation, pneumothorax, pneumonia, atelectasis, pleural effusion, so then the list goes on and on and on. If you look at the sensitivity and specificity, almost every single diagnosis is above 95%. And when it comes to interstitial syndrome, that is the wet lung status, it is 100%, whether we are talking about sensitivity and specificity. Complete pneumothorax, 100% sensitive uh, modality. Now, from a diagnostic instrument to a respiratory monitoring tool. So, if you have a pneumothorax, and there would be certain signs I would be showing in my future slides, you find that point at one particular area, and you see, fine, my patient is not in distress. He is not tachycardic, he is not tachypneic, he is not desaturating. I will just mark that point, and I would like to wait. With time, I would again go and scan him, and if that lung point is increasing in size, that itself tells me, yes, my pneumothorax is increasing, and probably if the patient has started showing signs of distress, I would like to intervene. After putting an intercostal tube, you can again see the resolution in terms of pneumothorax is decreasing, because if you, let's say, you do a first chest X-ray and the pneumothorax was not completely resolved, how often do you repeat it? Do you do it every second hourly till the time the entire pneumothorax is resolved? The ultrasound will tell you that. Similarly, for pulmonary edema, there are certain signs which I would be saying. This was the first and the only guideline which has been published about ultrasound. And this was specifically on lung ultrasound and probably all authorities of the world sat down and they published this international evidence-based recommendations for point-of-care lung ultrasound in intensive care medicine in 2012. And there were certain grade A recommendations for that. What they said was, what are the requirements when we want to do a lung ultrasound? And actually, any of the probe could be used, but the best probe is the vascular and the linear probe. But if the patient is morbidly obese or the thick chest wall, edematous chest wall, hairy chest wall, you can still look at the curvilinear probe. How do you scan it? You scan it in two areas. So the first scanning would start in a longitudinal pattern. So it would start in this manner reason you need to scan the entire chest if you go horizontally scanning each intercostal space you would probably take a lot of time in scanning the entire patient so start scanning in a longitudinal manner the area where we start seeing certain artifacts that is the area where we would be converting our probe from a longitudinal to the horizontal axis and we would be doing the entire examination how do we Decide which zone is that. So theoretically, we divide each hemithorax into six areas. So there would be 12 areas to scan in a patient. Lateral sternal margin, anterior axillary line, and the vertebral column. At the posterior vertebral column, you draw an imaginary line at the level of the nipple. So you have zone one and two, three and four, five and six on one side. Similar six zones on the other side. In a walking patient, you would probably find more findings in zone one. In an ICU or a bedridden patient, you would start finding, start having findings in zone four, five, and six because they are posteriorly. Now, what happens is we hardly turn our patients to auscultate them, to examine them, but you would have most of the findings, the consolidation, the ARDS, the pleural effusions located here, and that is the area where you need to scan very fast. It follows the surface imaging technique. So if there is air, you would have in zone 1 and 2. If there is fluid, you would have in zone 4, 5, and 6. So this is the first image that you develop when you put your lung ultrasound probe. So these two black areas are the ribs. So the uh, ultrasound beam will not cross it, so you won't see any image. This movement is the visceral and the uh, parietal pleura sliding over each other. And this is what we call as lung sliding, right? So this is the pleura. This non-mobile structure is the skin and the subcutaneous tissue. So up till here is the real-time images and beyond pleura because this is air. So as I said, ultrasound will not penetrate anything which is filled with air and beyond that we see artifacts. So after the ultrasound hits the pleura, we will have artifacts and lung ultrasound is purely about interpretation of these artifacts. So 
how do we define normal lung in an ultrasound language we say that the pleura is sliding we say there are a lines a stands for air so a lines are horizontal lines and they are parallel to the pleural line the line which was sliding the lines are parallel to that line and we would see a sign called seashore sign i'll show you what is that sign so this is the to and fro movement of the pleura what we call as lung sliding and if i put an M mode on this, that is the motion mode, I will see this kind of pattern which is called as seashore sign. Why is it called seashore? If you see a sea from a distance, the calmer part would be the waves and the granular part would be the sand. So seashore sign. So this part which is calm is the skin and the subcutaneous tissue which is not moving and the pleura which is sliding is causing the alveoli to basically go in a jerky kind of motion and this gives rise to the sandy appearance. So this is the skin and the subcutaneous tissue, pleura and the lung and this is called as the seashore sign. This is classical for a normal lung. Yes, this can also be there in COPD lung. Again, we, we say it's a dry lung, an aerated lung, so, but that also depends on the history. So the first artifact that we see in lung ultrasound is the A line, so they are called as artifacts. They are horizontal lines. If you can appreciate these horizontal lines which are parallel to the pleural line. So these are horizontal lines parallel to the pleural line and they are separated by the regular intervals. The distance between the skin and the pleura would be equal to the distance between the first artifact, between the second artifact, between the third artifact. So this is how it happens and they are seen in normal aerated lung. That is important. If you have a predominant A lines and the patient is breathless, asthma or COPD could be your diagnosis. But if you see predominant A lines and there is no sliding, basically you are just seeing A lines, you are not seeing pleura. So it means air is outside the pleura in a very layman language. And what does that mean? It's pneumothorax, right? So the next artifact is B lines. B stands very simply for wet lungs. If I have to put it in absolute simple language, B lines is equal to wet lungs. So they would emerge from the pleura or the consolidation and they look like a laser show, right? Where do you find this? Pulmonary edema. You would find this in consolidation. You would find in this in different stages of ARDS. So they move with the pleura and they reach the base of the screen. That is important difference between B lines and the lines which were in subcutaneous emphysema, what we call as E lines, right? So, but they reach the base of the screen. Lung sliding, right? This is what I said, the lung would slide with every phase of respiration. So, one, we decided that this was not esophageal intubation. The second is you decide that is this an endobronchial intubation or not. So, for looking at the bilateral ventilation, this is for the left side that you are looking at. With every breath, the spleen would come in and go out. Similarly, for right side, liver, kidney, and if you can appreciate, this is the white pleura which will slide here. So this tells me after intubation, if you are just scanning these two areas, they are moving. You are very sure that this is a bilateral uh, uh, ventilation rather than an endobronchial intubation. So. If I have to say this is an endobronchial intubation, what is happening here? The pleura is sliding. So I would call this as a sliding present and lung pulse. Now what is lung pulse is? We have two movements in lung. One is the movement with the respiration and the second is transmission of cardiac pulsations to the lung. So lung is pulsating. The predominant movement is the breathing movement. So we are not able to see on an ultrasound the lung pulsations. If I stop the predominant movement, I would see the other movement which is the lung pulse. So lung pulse is a pathology which tells me that that part of the lung is not getting ventilated. So that can happen in an apneic patient that can happen in an endobronchial intubation. So if your tube has gone to the right side, your right will go to and fro, the left would just pulse. So if you can appreciate, this linear part is at the same point and is just pulsating. Probably the patient is tachycardic, so it is moving fast. It looks that the pleura is sliding, but that is not the case. For pneumothorax, as I said, the monitoring part, and this is called a lung point, very, very 
pathognomic for pneumothorax. If you can look at this illustration, if you're scanning from an anterior part where there is air outside the lungs, you will have no movement of the pleura till the time you reach a point where the pleura is still attached to the lung and that is the point where you will have one side will be uh, uh, sliding, the other side is not and this point is called lung point. As per the recommendation, if you find a single lung point, this is grade 1A recommendation, it is 100% sure of pneumothorax. So that is a grade 1A recommendation. B lines, right? If you have these kind of B lines, they are very, very classical for fluid overload I, or I would say as wet lung status. Now, there can be many conditions where you can have these wet lung status. So if you have these in bilateral lungs, you would say this is pulmonary edema. If you have this kind of pattern in a unilateral hemithorax, right? Only in one side, not on the other side. That cannot be pulmonary edema. This is probably a consolidation or a lung contusion depending on what situation the patient is coming. Consolidation. Now, we call this as hepatization. Why? Because it looks like the hepatic part. So it looks like liver. The lung is totally collapsed, probably because of the weight of the fluid here. This is the liver. This is the lung. This is pleural effusion. So consolidated lung would look absolutely like a liver. Right? That is the reason we say just scan the liver to look at the lung. The another classical sign for consolidation is what we call as the shred sign. A smooth part which is non-ventilated, basically this has already become consolidated, but whereas a lot of B lines which tell us that this area still has some air left and this is called a shred sign. How do you use it? We use this as a monitoring tool. For example, today I saw a patient and who has this findings, you start your therapy, whether that is ventilation or antibiotics or anything. And tomorrow, if this irregular line is moving towards the apex, this tells me that more and more lung is getting aerated. Now the pleura is shifting towards the normal baseline. So this tells that the lung is getting aerated and this tells that the patient is improving. Again, very pathognomic of consolidation, and this is called dynamic air bronchogram. The air is moving with every phase of respiration. This is not a contrast. This is air we see with every phase of inspiration, right? The inspiration, the air goes in and out because the air is not trapped inside. In atelectasis, the air is trapped inside, so it would appear as white, white dots, whereas in consolidation, it would go in and out with every phase of respiration and this is called as dynamic air bronchogram. What I said with atelectasis, the air is trapped, so it doesn't move with any phase of respiration. It would appear as white, white, white dots. Again, collapsed lung, massive effusion. This white line is the diaphragm that we are seeing in. Effusion, looking dirty. This was hemothorax in one of the transplant patients that we had tapped. And if you look at the lung, this looks like a plankton on the seabed, right? Massive uh, pleural effusion. ARDS, again, this is a grade 1A recommendation with the help of an ultrasound. This is called as subpleural consolidation. Beneath the pleura, small, small areas of consolidation. And this is grade 1A recommendation that if you find this in any place of the patient, this is classical for ARDS. So when we look at the B lines, you can just characterize them that if the patient has acute pulmonary edema, the B lines or the wet lines or the laser-like would be totally collaged. They would be very near to each other. Whereas if the patient has a lung pathology in terms of an interstitial syndrome, interstitial lung disease, they would be far, they would be thick in nature. So this is just a representation as in if the lines are very close to each other, you would say that this patient probably has a left ventricular failure. So with lung sliding present bilaterally, and B lines present bilaterally, what can be the cause of respiratory distress? Consolidation? Pneumothorax? Can we have pneumothorax as the diagnosis? Why? Because we have lung sliding, right? So the answer would be pulmonary edema. Again, the lung is sliding, but they are all wet. The third question would be the features of pneumothorax on a lung ultrasound would be the lung sliding is present, 
lung pulse is present, lung point is present. Is this possible? Lung sliding absent, lung pulse present, lung point present. Is this possible? Or is this possible? Is it three or is it two? See, lung pulse, try to understand. If I am saying lung pulse, it means the pleura is intact. That is pulsating. In pneumothorax, the pleura is not intact. The air is outside the pleura, right? So the answer has to be the lung pulse has to be absent. Lung point may or may not be present. Reason? If it's a massive pneumothorax, you will never find a lung point. Which is the true statement about B lines? They arise from pleura, they reach the base of the scanning area but do not move with the respiration. Or they can be used for th therapeutic monitoring purposes in patients with pulmonary edema. Both B lines and A lines can be present simultaneously. And you need at least three B lines to rule out pneumothorax. So they can be used as a monitoring. You start your therapy and if the number of B lines are decreasing, right, that tells you that the patient is improving. And this is again grade 1A recommendation when it comes to B line as per the guidelines that they have to be used as a monitoring tool in patients with left ventricular failure. When it comes to circulation, and this is, I'm not talking as a, as, a, as a cardiology point of view, I would be talking as an intensivist point of view, so we call this as a cardiac ultrasound rather than echocardiogram, right? Because this is a limited examination. Secondly, the answers are qualitative and only eyeballing. We are not putting any number to it, we are not doing any major measurements to it, and the, diagnose, the purpose is diagnosis. Sometimes it is very obvious, sometimes it is not. And generally we answer the questions in a bimodal answer as in yes or no. Maybe, may not be, will again put us into the same frame of mind. So the answers are bimodal in uh, examination. And the commonest views, sub parasternal, apical, suprasternal. So you would have sub parasternal, apical, and suprasternal, but these are the three commonest views that we would be looking at. When you look at the parasternal long axis, that's the only view where your pointer is pointing towards the left shoulder of the, uh, towards the uh, right shoulder of the patient, and you would have the findings as this video, the pointer is pointing towards the right shoulder of the patient, right? This probe is the phase array probe or the cardiac probe that is there in most of the ultrasound machines. And this is the kind of finding. So you will have this as the left ventricle, this as the left atrium, left ventricular outlet track. You will see the aortic, uh, 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 sorry, uh, valve there and the right ventricle at the top. You can also see the descending aorta at the bottom. Then the apical four chamber view, the classical, please don't look at the anatomy that is near the nipple, try to find the heart when we talk about in critical care. Yes, you can tilt the patient if it is possible, but on a ventilated patient with tubes here and there, it's not possible to tilt and turn the patient. So let, it, let the patient be there at the same posture and try to find the heart. So the left ventricle, right ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, the septum is little convex towards the right ventricle. Left ventricle will always appear bigger than the right ventricle if it's a normal physiological heart. So if I have talk about eyeballing, the question is, are all the walls of the heart moving? As an intensivist, I need to answer because if this patient is coming in shock, my DD has to be ruled out. Is it, is it cardiogenic shock? Is it obstructive shock? Is it septic shock? Or is it hypovolemic shock? So is all the walls of the heart moving? Yes. Is left ventricle appearing bigger than the right ventricle? Yes. Is the septum convex towards the RV? Yes. So these are the major reasons. Why? Because we are looking at systolic dysfunction, we are not looking at diastolic dysfunction as the cause of acute shock in any of the patients. So as I said, for the apical four chamber, again the pointer now would be towards the left shoulder for rest, all uh, examination it is rest, left shoulder just for the parasternal long axis. So this is the kind of uh, activity you would see, so left ventricle, right ventricle, both the valves are there. Then the fifth chamber where you see the aortic valve, the LVOT and you can just Tilt the um, uh, transducer where you're looking at the uh, four chamber view and you would find the same findings except the fifth chamber starts appearing. So 
you would start looking at the fifth chamber at this point, right? So this is the fifth chamber that we are looking at, the aortic valve. The subcostal view, mostly in smokers, you would find this view because the lungs are hyperinflated. COPD, the lungs are hyperinflated. It's very difficult to find a classical four-chamber view. Subzephoid view is a good view in them, where you would see the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the right atrium, the right atrium ostium, and you would also see the in, uh, inferior vena cava uh, from there, where you look at the IVC status. So we are looking at the eyeballing movement, same the measurements. Now, if the patient is coming in hypotension, right? So how do you assess that what is the reason? So first look at the right ventricle. Is the right ventricle dilated and is there a systolic dysfunction? If the answer is no, then you're probably ruling out right ventricular dysfunction causes pulmonary embolism would be one of them. Then you look at the left ventricular systolic function. If you say left ventricular systolic function is fine, so you're probably ruling out the myocardial infarction. Then what is the preload status? Is the preload responsive or not? If you say no, that is okay. Then you look at the vasodilatation, that is the septic shock. So where you look at the end systolic area and the end diastolic area of the left ventricle. So if you want to draw a frank starling on a patient, right, and this is the two chamber view where you look at the left ventricle, you give them a fluid challenge, and if the size of the uh, LV, that is the end uh, uh, diastolic area, is improving, that tells you that the patient is showing a response to your fluid challenge. But after a certain level, if there is no change, so that is the point where your patient has reached the plateau part of the Frank Starling, and that is the point where you need to stop giving fluids. Because if you give more and more fluids to this patient, the fluid would seep out and probably the patient would become hypoxemic. He would start desaturating. So if the patient is still hypotensive after an adequate fluid challenge, you would start adding inotropes. IVC, fluid responsiveness, is the key to it, right? So you look at the IVC status. This is the subcostal view. This is the liver. This is the right atrium. And where the hepatic vein is getting inserted, if you can look at it, you look at the IVC size there. But if you look at this, this IVC is totally taut. So probably this patient will not be fluid responsive. Yeah. It is also included in the CPR. Due to that uh, shortage of time, you may have to run through it. I'll just take five more minutes, probably. So when you look at the CPR, and once you are doing your pulse check for 10 seconds, that is the time where you would like to do it, the reversible causes, that is five H's and five T's. And with the help of an ultrasound, we will be able to look at the hypovolemia, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and cardiac or pulmonary thrombosis, just when you are doing the pulse checks. Please do not interrupt the CPR. So when somebody is doing the carotid check, put your probe and look for these findings. So. What is the true statement about IVC assessment? Does it correlate very well with CVP? Anybody? The meta-analysis doesn't support this. IVC correlation with CVP is not there. IVC measurement can be done, should be taken at the level of RA ostium. It may not be completely reliable in abdominal compartment syndrome, and low tidal volume ventilation has no bearing on IVC diameter. In abdominal compartment syndrome may not be completely reliable and that is where we need to be little cautious when we are interpreting the sizes and the variability and the distensibility. The next role is fast, right? And here we look at six cavities, perihepatic, perisplenic, the pericardial and the pelvic cavity. We also extend it to the pleural cavity which is called the extended fast. So when a patient is coming from trauma and you have this kind of scenario where free fluid is there in the Morrison's pouch, patient is hemodynamically unstable, you call this as fast positive, this patient needs to go to the OR. No radiology, nothing, patient is hemodynamically unstable coming from a trauma scenario. Similarly, between the spleen and the kidney, if you are looking free fluid, again, fast positive. When you're looking at the pelvis or posteriorly to the bladder, you can see that. So next question is the correct interpretation of the FAST scan would be hemodynamically unstable patient with FAST scan negative exploration in OT, hemodynamically unstable patient with FAST scans positive shift to radiology for intervention, unstable patient FAST scan negative retroperitoneal bleed may be present, hemodynamically stable patient with FAST scan positive shift to OT. Are we sure? Four or three? Hemodynamically stable patient, remember this. 
unstable patients goes to theater, right? The DVT part is important. We should scan femorals and popliteal. This is what critical care DVT scanning is there. Radiologists will do an entire scanning. We do a two-point compression test. So we do the femoral vein and the femoral artery. We look at it. So if you are compressing, the vein is totally compressed. But if you look at this part, there is a white echogenic material. If you find that, please don't keep on compressing it. The thrombus will become an embolus. <laughs> right? So again, for the popliteal, the same phenomena. If you find it, once is fine, please don't keep on doing it. That's the message for this. When you look at the pulmonary embolism, this is a very classical sign. That is the McConnell sign, the free wall uh, hypokinesia of the right ventricle. Right? That is a very, very classical sign for this. So I'll skip this question. This is, as I said, the McConnell sign is there. Optic ultrasound uh, is a newer modality. I will just show you the findings. So this is how it would look at just a lot of jelly and put the scan on the eye very gently. You would find the anterior chamber, the posterior chamber, retina is attached and this part is important which is the optic nerve sheath and this is which we are doing it very commonly specifically in, in transplant patients, in preeclamptic patients, in neurosurgical patients where we look at the optic nerve sheath diameter and if it is more than 5.7 mm we say the ICP is more than 20 that patient needs an intervention so if that patient was not explored he requires an exploration if this patient was having um, high ICP risk then the, probably the ICP is increasing and this is very very classical it has been compared with CT scan more than 97 percent sensitivity and specificity of ICP monitoring is there you can also look at the pupillary examination. So as I said, correlation is more than 5.7 ICP is more than 20. Last few slides, two or three slides, ultrasound technique. This is how we drape it with the help of a sterile sheet and a tegaderm. And we do it in a dynamic manner, not in a static manner. So you'd look at it, mark it, come, no, sorry, that's as equal to as blind. What we prefer is a longitudinal axis where we see the entire shaft of the needle, right? Now this is when you are doing in a transverse in a collapsible patient, if you look at the vein is totally collapsing and the risk that you will puncture the posterior wall is very high. Whereas in a long axis, you see the entire shaft of the needle that would come in, in the, and this is how you do it. You place the probe on the neck and you puncture it along the path and you would see the entire shaft of the needle coming in. This was one of the complications that has been shown. If you can see, this is coming and probably it will hit the uh, uh, artery and there would be a large hematoma created here, even on an ultrasound guidance. It's, it's already punctured the posterior wall. And see, it's, it's there in the, and this is the size of the hematoma which was created. Similarly, the subclavian vein could be, uh, my lecture can go on, I would uh, stop at this moment, right? Thank you so much. That was a very uh, well-made presentation, Dr. Gupta. Uh, we don't have time for questions, but uh, I would definitely like to add that uh, focused ultrasound with a critical care uh, clinician's mind behind it will prove to be an invaluable uh, tool in making a fast diagnosis, be it the head, thorax, abdomen, or elsewhere. Uh, now, uh, I would like uh, to request Dr. Anand Natani, sir, to kindly felicitate Dr. Sachin Gupta, sir.